Thanks for joining me, Wayne. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks, Mark. And yourself? Good, good. Now, I am here in Ames, Iowa for the National Association of Plant Breeders Annual Meeting. Uh, you are involved with the Plant Breeding Coordinating Committee. In fact, you are the outgoing chair. You couldn't be here this year, so we are doing it remotely, but it's great to have this technology so that we can still chat. Can you give us a quick rundown of what the PBCC does? Sure. Uh, it is a uh, uh, committee that is charged uh, with identifying and bringing solutions uh, to issues that are faced by public universities and public uh, plant breeders. And we, uh, uh, we somewhat divide our uh, initiatives into uh, enhancing communication, uh, disseminating information about plant, public plant breeding in particular, but plant breeding in general, uh, promoting plant breeding when we have the opportunity. Uh, we do that through uh, uh, white papers and uh, video contests uh, for graduate students. Uh, and we try to identify research and educational opportunities. Uh, for example, uh, the uh, breadth and depth of plant breeding courses across land grant universities and certainly across other agricultural universities uh, varies considerably uh, from uh, a land grant university having 20 field-based plant breeders plus molecular folks to universities that have one. Uh, and, and so uh, we hope to uh, uh, develop in the future uh, some modules or dissemination of lectures, uh, lecture content uh, broadly to any of the uh, agriculture universities that teach uh, plant breeding and genetics through plant breeding uh, and be able to disseminate uh, uh, some of the expertise at the larger universities across to those that have fewer faculty across the country. Now, you are outgoing chair of the PBCC. As you look back on the last the last year of being chair, what what are you most proud of, and and what are you most excited about when you think about the the future of PBCC? Well, I'm going to highlight a couple of things. I hope you've been by the PBCC table uh, in the common area at the meetings, uh, and I hope that uh, there you had a chance to see uh, uh, a couple of uh, success stories. Uh, one was on uh, Dr. Kate Evans's. Uh, recent apple, Cosby Crisp, uh, and one was a little older. It was some work by Charlie's, Dr. Charles Simpson uh, in intergressing resistance to root knot nematode from a wild peanut that didn't look a lot like a peanut uh, into uh, cultivated uh, peanut. Uh, and uh, those templates uh, were the brainchild of uh, Dr. Igo Helm who is the uh, incoming vice chair uh, for PBCC. Uh, and we've had some good feedback uh, on that. We have talked for years, both at PBCC and at NAPB, of how to get success stories out into the hands of decision makers, as well as we're getting a lot of thought to how do we get it in the hands of younger uh, folks who know nothing about plant breeding. Uh, and uh, uh, we think these are going to be uh, uh, a good format for us to do that. Uh, the other thing that has uh, uh, accomplished over the past year, we completed a survey, which was also on the common on the PBCC table in the common area. Completed survey to uh, kind of a quick and dirty look at where uh, new PhDs in plant breeding go uh, in their first position, their first job. Uh, and uh, we brought that to fruition in the, in the past year, and we continued uh, into the second year of our uh, video contest where we invite uh, graduate students to make a video about plant breeding. Uh, we, we identified topics. The last one was a day in the life for plant breeding graduate student or something like that, and those, uh, I hope you had a chance to take a look at those. It, it gives one... Um, a lot of confidence uh, in the future because uh, those those young people, they do a fantastic job. That's true. And in terms of having 
confidence in the future. The last question I asked you is, you know, what you're most proud of having accomplished. And, and for my next question, I was wondering, on the flip side of that, is, is there one thing that maybe you weren't able to accomplish that you're sort of uh, maybe leaving to your successor? And, and what's that one thing that, that, that you wish you could have accomplished but didn't? And, and what's your advice to, to Duke Pauly as he takes over as chair for how, how the PBCC can maybe be successful in, in trying to accomplish that over the next 12 months? Well, if I had to limit to one thing, uh, it would be uh, development of protocol to get the success stories and the story of plant breeding in on the desk and in the hands of decision makers. And I'm not talking about legislators. Uh, we, we, are, we cannot lobby, uh, but there are deans and experiment de station directors. There are science teachers in high schools. There are BOAG teachers. Uh, there are community colleges that will have uh, a genetics and plant breeding module, if you will, as a part of their science classes. And we need to dig around how to disseminate. We're good at putting information together. That, that's, that's the easy part. It is the dissemination of who do we send it to? How do we send it to them? How do we do it on a regular and, and normal basis? And I think that's our, if I had to pick one challenge for the next year, I think that would be it. Now, the theme of this year's NAPB meeting is the past, present, and future of plant breeding. You've also served as president of the NAPB, as well as now serving as chair of the PBCC. When you think about both of these organizations, when you look at that big picture, what do you feel is the biggest challenge that, that faces these two organizations right now? Well, I think on the NAPB side, we have uh, evolved to a well-established organization. Uh, we can do, everyone can, we can do a lot more with uh, more money. You know, that, that, that's, 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 a, that's a common uh, uh, comment from every organization, but, but unlike uh, some of the other professional organizations such as uh, ASA and CSSA and others that I've been with, Port Science Society, you know, they, they have publications, they have income streams. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think from a long-term perspective for NAPB, uh, and I'm a big, big fan of NAPB. I think they do a terrific job. Uh, uh, and, you know, our only income stream is uh, the annual fees. And that will only carry you so far. And we have talked about in APB for years uh, about uh, an endowment program and, and uh, uh, trying to get a, a solid financial basis for the organization. I think if we can do that. We're, we're, we're in good shape. PBCC, on the other hand, we are a coordinating committee by the USDA. Uh, and um, uh, we, we, we don't look for and or have a financial base. NAPB uh, provides a few dollars for us to do a, a few things, such as the uh, artist work with the new, the uh, success stories. Uh, NAPB uh, paid for that. Uh, and it's a great working relationship between the two organizations. As you already know, uh, it was the Plant Breeding Coordinating Committee that gave birth to NAPB. It came, came out of that group meeting, uh, whatever it was, 15 years ago uh, or something. And so it's always been a, a, a good uh, relationship. It's, uh, and it's complimentary. It's not competitive. And uh, it, both organizations, it's same, same people are in both organizations, and they're, they're a great bunch of folks to work with. And switching to your work, you're a cotton breeder. What What's new and exciting for you and in, in cotton breeding right now? What, what's the big the big thing on, on your agenda? Can you talk a little bit about your recent work? Sure, be happy to. The uh, uh, 
for the last 15, 20 years, I've concentrated on fiber quality. Now, most folks who don't think about textiles and think about yarns and think about cotton and fibers wouldn't give much thought of what fiber quality is. But cotton fiber, being a natural fiber, comes in, it's produced on the plant in a number of different lengths and across genotypes, across varieties, and different fiber strength, how strong it is. Um, and you, you compare that to a man-made fiber. If, if a spinning uh, entity wants a, to produce a yarn from a five with fibers that are one inch long, they cut that big old long string of, of polyester to one inch. Every one of them is one inch. Well, in kind, it goes from about less than a half inch to a couple of inches. Uh, and so it, it presents challenges to, uh, uh, to spinning mills. We, we have used, uh, up until 1970-ish, we, we, there, there's only been one spinning technology, and that is you, you, you pull fibers out somewhat parallel to each other and you put a twist in them. About 1970, some technology came along called open-end spinning, where we, we pull the fibers completely apart, and by air movement, we, we wrap fibers uh, around each other. And so there, there, there's not as much twisting. And, and that gives us, by the nature of the, of the yarn development, or the yarn structure gives you a weaker yarn. So we had that, we breeders, over the course of about 20 years, increased the, the, the strength of those individual fibers by about 25% so that the yarn we produced on this open end technology was as good as the yarn and the different sizes of yarn that were produced on ring spinning. Well, now there's a new technology coming on the, on the scene called air jet or vortex. And it produces a, a yarn about uh, 20 times faster than ring and five times faster than rotor. And so obviously, cost per unit of production goes down. You would expect spinners to move to this new technology. And now we're caught again in that situation where the where the polyester, it was developed for polyester fibers or man-made fibers. And we've got to make the cotton fiber fit that technology. And so that has been my uh, uh, challenge over the last uh, 15 or 20 years of my career. And particularly over the last five or six, because that rotor technology, not rotor technology, the uh, air jet or vortex technology, we have determined that we can produce the type of fibers that will spin on that newer technology and give us a yarn as good as the ring spun, which is the classic yarn that we have. There's a lot of other people doing a lot of other active things. There's a lot of breeders working with disease resistance uh, these days uh, it, it, at the commercial level. As you well know, you, you've got to keep producing higher yields uh, uh, because your, the farmer's margins continue to decrease. Uh, and, and so there's a lot, of, a lot of challenges out there, a lot of opportunities for cotton breeders as well as for every other commodity you can think of. Uh, but for me personally, uh, that's been my primary goal for the last uh, several years. We're looking forward to seeing what the future holds for your cotton breeding program and for PBCC and NAPB. It's great to be at the meeting here this year. And it's nice to have an in-person meeting for the first time in two years. And I'm glad we could join uh, each other remotely here, Wayne. And thank you so much for your time today and have yourself a great week. My pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity to visit with you and I uh, hope you uh, enjoy uh, the conclusion of the meetings. Take care. <laughs>